to get going. You're all very welcome. Thank you for fighting your way through the, the evening traffic uh, to, to be here for this, uh, this very important seminar. Um, it's a great privilege for me, my name is Brian Nolan, I'm Principal of the College of Human Sciences in UCD, and uh, I'm uh, on behalf of, of the University uh, and the College, uh, delighted to be welcoming uh, our, our eminent speaker before this evening. And in doing so, I should say that it's the, the latest in what's been a very productive and stimulating set of talks uh, hosted and uh, organised and hosted jointly uh, between Trinity College Dublin and University College Dublin. So that's, uh, that's something we're very pleased about. This, this particular uh, lecture in this series is also being held in cooperation with the UCD Centre for War Studies. So, um, you'll, you'll well know, and the reason you're here, uh, is that uh, our speaker tonight is, is Professor Duncan Peterson. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I, I was uh, uh, pointing out to him that uh, for the speakers on these occasions, you get to listen to what you say about yourself on your own website uh, very frequently. Uh, and, and, and today, I'm afraid, is no exception, but you, you, you know better than I do um, uh, just, just how uh, prominent and eminent our speaker is. Uh, he's founder and director of the Hamburg Institute for Social Research and currently a professor of German literature at that university. And he's, he's remarkably prominent both in public and scholarly debates. Uh, he's been awarded a, a very lengthy set of uh, medals and honorary degrees. And the one that, that uh, struck me and perhaps uh, captures, cap encapsulates them all is an award for outstanding contributions to the influence of sociology on public life. So, uh, his topic for tonight, uh, on, on which he is in the happy position of, uh, of uh, talking to his uh, recent book, uh, is Trust and Violence. And uh, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Andreas to say a little bit more about that, but just to conclude by saying how delighted I am uh, to be uh, have the privilege of welcoming, welcoming him here on behalf of UCD. Well, welcome and uh, thanks very much. My name is Andrea Sess. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, School of Sociology at, uh, at UCD. Uh, thanks particularly to our guest speaker, Professor Reimsmark, for accepting the invitation and joining us here. Um, let me just say, briefly say this is the third talk in the joint TCD UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series. I have to, would like to just uh, convey my, uh, the apologies of Daniel Fass was my co-organizer from Trinity, but he had to go on decent, uh, he had to go on urgent business to, to London today. It was uh, something that just emerged the last couple of days. Um, just a few words before we start uh, about the book Trust and Violence, which is the subject uh, of Professor Wimsmann's talk. It was first published in Germany in 2008, so that's five years ago, and then with the normal speed these things work five years later. 2012, oh, that's four years later, sorry, uh, four years later, it's now available in English translation for Princeton University Press. Um, just a few words, and I'm not going to give a lengthy speech here, but just a few uh, maybe general observations. And I think we have to read Jan Philipp Rehmsma's book in, in context. Uh, every three years, a book comes along that defines the field and makes us pause for a moment and to take stock. That's, I think, also true for this book, Trust and Violence. As to the wider context, I was thinking about related sister concepts to trust and violence. Uh, conceptualizations such as loyalty, obligation, but also uh, notions of injustice. And by injustice, I mean not just in the sense that justice the theories talks about it, about them, um, but in a, in a different way. It's not just the, the the other side of justice. Injustice is, is a lot more. For the political theorist Judith Klar, um, of all the vices, cruelty was the one that ranked highest and had to be addressed first. And from that she derived her argument of what she called the liberalism of fear, a delicate political idea and project um, that needs constant reaffirmation, nurturing and support because it's so thin and maybe this civilizational line that separates us uh, is, needs to be man constantly maintained, is always in danger of being, being threatened. And I read Professor Grimsma's book, Trust and Violence, pretty much as an attempt 
uh, in that respect and in that regard. Let me briefly return to the epistemological interest of, of trust and violence. Uh, there are three guiding questions that you encounter in, the, in the, almost the first few pages of the book. The first question is, how did we arrive at the current European transatlantic constellation, which is based on specific rules, regulations and conduct in relation to the use of violence and legitimate force? That's the first question. The second one is, how is it possible to close the gap between the image that modern society has of itself as aiming at peaceful regulation and rejecting or reducing violence, and on the other side, the continuing violence that we can still encounter? The third question is, how is it possible that the excess of violence that we've witnessed in the last century and partly also in this century uh, has touched us to a certain extent? I think nobody would uh, reject that notion. Yet, it has not touched us to such an extent or so much that we have opted for another path. So something needs to be explained here. The answer, as Professor Rentner shows in his book, lies in trust and in trustful relationships. But how can we do this? Um, how can we build meaningful trust relationships after having seen that sometimes normality and barbarism can go hand in hand? It's a very thin line, and the German example tells you quite well uh, what happens if a country or that produced the famous canon from Beethoven to you name it uh, can then end up uh, a few decades later in, 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 in barbarism. Uh, there is a question that needs to be needs to be answered. There are many layers in this book, and I cannot talk about all of them. Just one uh, one final observation, and then I will hand over to our speaker. Uh, one of them is, of course, the question: How has sociology dealt <coughs> extreme violence and fear? And by violence, I mean a form of violence that is purposeless, uh, senseless to a certain extent and against the typical means and relationship that usually prevails in modern Western societies. So perhaps, just a question, perhaps, you know, when we talk about this kind of violence, um, maybe questions come up that are very uncomfortable to sociologists. End of society? Does it, what does, it, does it make sense to speak you know, in Auschwitz of a society? Um, do we talk at the end of meaning in the sense of means and relationship. Um, these are questions that are touched upon in the book. Um, and I would like to now hand over to Professor Rensmore. There will be also time to uh, some time to ask a question after the talk. Thank you very much. And again thank you for your invitation. <coughs> I will talk now about let's say more or less 15 minutes to you about trust and about mistrust and to the idea to the concept of violence I can, will come in the last part of the lecture. Trust is a fuzzy concept. The first problem you face when trying to understand trust from a from a philosophical or sociological viewpoint, is that the word is quite common in everyday language. Everyone <coughs> knows that a trustworthy person is nice to know, or that someone who is too trusting might run into problems in life. But on the whole, the everyday sense of trust is that it's something good. The psychologist Eric Erickson believed that <clears throat> or basic trust is something that we achieve if we're, like, if we're lucky in childhood and that gives us self-confidence later in life. If we don't achieve this in childhood, we are left with an ur mistrust, <coughs> basic mistrust. Whether Erickson was right about the existence of a basic trust or whether his concept is just a form of compensation for a basic mistrust that frames the human condition, we'll never be able to determine empirically. I think it all depends on, on your prior philosophical commitments. We all have them, and all of us can escape them. Still, all of us regard trust as something good, 
<coughs> and this holds true even for dictators. Even a hardcore Leninist, you remember that Lenin said that trust is good, but it's better to control people. But even a hardcore Leninist has to trust in those who help him control those he cannot trust. And in the end, even the most violent dictator has to go to sleep, and he needs <coughs> trust that uh, there's something who um, is there and will kill him. So trust is good and it somehow works. We all accept that trust is the foundation of our financial system, but we never feel quite at ease with this knowledge. Why? Because trust is one thing you can't be trusting of. Trust, it seems, requires a fundamental mistrust. If trust is a fuzzy concept, how do we make our understanding of it more precise? One way is to analyze trust in the many different ways, ways it appears in ordinary language and daily life. No friendship without trust, the end of trust is the end of friendship. But is friendship based on trust, based on trust, or only somehow based on it? I can have a close friend and say, I had to trust him with everything, but not with the truth about X, Y, Z. You can't trust him with that. But he can be your friend, if you know that. You may analyze whether the healing power of a placebo consists mostly in the relation a patient has to his doctor. The patient may believe that the placebo heals him because he thinks his doctor and his prescriptions are trustworthy. But it's been shown that expensive placebos have more healing power than the cheap ones. Is it because the patient doesn't trust the doctor, he gives me what is really good, or does he trust the markets? The pharmaceutical industry spends more money for developing a really good drug, so they've earned the money. Or does he believe that the pharmaceutical industry is a bunch of scoundrels and switches to the lesser evil entry to treatments labeled natural or something like that? But will he choose a cheap drug? Maybe he will take some for free if the healer that gave it to him claims he isn't allowed to earn money from his healing powers. The patient accepts the gift and maybe next time he drops a bit more into the beggar's head. Does he think that the transcendental world is a market economy after all? We don't have clear answers to these questions, but can find out more by conducting field research, surveys, tests, and so on. And in the end, you may discover, say, that blue and yellow pills have better healing effects than white ones, which is true. This survey exists. Personally, I would prefer white pills, and I probably wouldn't be fond of grey ones. Whatever such studies conclude, and whatever their results and theoretical reflections might be, the outcome will be that trust is everywhere, but that what we exactly mean by trust differs from situation to situation. It is a fuzzy patchwork, and that is also what makes you nervous. The temptation may be to say that in the end, trust lies behind every social phenomenon. And there have always been theorists who said that it is power or violence or interest combined with power, force or violence that in the end makes society what it is or was or will be or makes a change and keeps it together or give, gives it its characteristic features. You want to find out the forces of innermost life that bind society to allude to Faust. Or you might have the fantasy of digging deeper and deeper until you find the bedrock where your spade turns. That's how Wittgenstein put the scientific desire and delusion. But it seems strange to compare trust to bedrock. Maybe it's just because of the metaphor. Things that are fuzzy don't cause spades to turn. If you analyze trust as an interpersonal relation, you analyze this relation and the role trust plays in it. It isn't necessary to define a concept of trust that covers every case. Instead, you'll find what Wittgenstein calls family resemblances, a concept I'm sure most of us is familiar with. 
If you analyze trust as an attitude towards social institutions, you'll discover the many ways trust is expressed. To trust the train service, to trust that your train will arrive on time, said, is a different kind of trust than when we trust that words and numbers written on a piece of paper mean money. And this meaning has a lot to do with the way you live your daily life. There are some sociologists who think that there's only one kind of trust, either personal or institutional, and you can somehow de deduce the one from the other. I don't think this works. You don't trust the train service because you trust the crew of the managing director. And you don't trust the train service because you had some good experiences with kind and competent train staff, after which you more or less unconsciously decided to trust the train service in general. And even if you insist on explaining trust in the train service like this, a similar approach would never work to explain our trust in the monetary system. What you need in any case, though, is the experience that it works. Once you have this experience, you see the occasional failure in a different light. When things don't work, you regard it as the exception. You say, next time I'll read the timetable twice before planning my excursion. Or, the cashier didn't accept this banknote, but that's because it was, because it was a counterfeit, counterfeit. Or, Lehman Brothers may have collapsed, but the Fed won't. The truth, however, is that trust can break down. It can happen vis-a-vis -vis people, with people you once you called friends, with strangers who welcomed into your home, who had robbed you, after which you mistrust each and every one you don't know. It can also happen vis-a-vis -vis institutions, at least via vis -vis some at least vis -vis some some institutions. As one someone as someone says, I'll never go to a hospital again. But what would it mean to say I no longer trust the monetary system? Do you return your paychecks? Do you stop working entirely? Do you steal your food instead of buying it? The examples show that it is easy to understand sentences of the form I don't trust in X or Z anymore in some cases, and that it is quite difficult, if not impossible, to understand them in others. If an academic says that he or she doesn't trust in the stability of a cosmic order, the person is likely saying, I'm a cosmologist who wants to present a new theory, and I trust that the Publication Committee of Science will accept my paper. When I ask the academic, what does the theory mean for your academic career, everyone understands what I'm saying. When I ask, what does that theory mean for your daily life, no one does. This was different for the ancient Aztecs, whose doubts about the stability of the cosmic order had practical consequences. Their beliefs led them to wage war against neighboring communities and round up as many prisoners as possible to sacrifice to the gods, who, if pleased by the sacrificial offering, prevented the world from coming to an end. The difference between the Aztec way of understanding the universe and ours, when it comes to the concept of trust, turns on the respective roles of religion and science, but also on a specific relation to social practices. The Aztecs thought they had a way of influencing the stability of the cosmic order. We don't. The Aztec way of thinking about the cosmic order produced a very complex social order. Priests, kings, warriors, architecture, architects, craftsmen, craftsmen art, art artists, empire, and so on. Our way of thinking about the stability of the cosmic order also has consequences for scientific standards, for academic careers, and times not so long ago for theological disputes. But it has no practical consequences that could compare to those of Aztec society. The modern or Western idea of the cosmic order shapes our knowledge of nearly everything, including technology, 
but we have no concept of how to influence the cosmic order itself. Even if we are religious, we do not pray that the laws of gravity continue to apply tomorrow as they did today. Our trust in the stability of the cosmic order is not so much a trust as a confidence. We are confident about things like the cosmic order because we don't know what else to do. The line between confidence and trust is fuzzy, however. Confidence is confidence in the world as such a kind of stability you don't have to think about. If you take a stone and drop it, you're confident it will fall downwards and not float to the sky. In Germany or Ireland, people have no reason to shake out their shoes in the morning. In regions with scorpions, they do. But if you do live in a region with scorpions, you can trust in your own safety, provided you take the right precautionary measures. The mistrust is appropriate. And you lack confidence, by contrast, you don't know when it's appropriate to be mistrustful, or what even means to be mistrustful in the aspect. For us, doubt of the stability of the cosmos would completely <coughs> undermine our confidence. For the Aztecs, Aztecs doubt of the stability of the cosmos opened up practical strategies of security. The line between confidence and trust much depends on the culture you live in, and cultures change. And only this kind of change is historically or sociologically relevant. Confidence might collapse. Someone may believe that the walls of his house are melting. He may think that others can read his thoughts or influence them by radio. In all cases, an idea, a diagnosis will be the diagnosis will be the same. This person has a mental disorder. <coughs> we think in terms of psychology or medicine. If a mental disorder is part of a collective paranoia, the, the help others provide will be of a different sort. <coughs> if someone thinks a neighbor is practicing witchcraft and enough people in the community believe it, be true, then they will collectively accuse the neighbor of witchcraft and condemn him or her to death. This is the way of restoring public trust in the social environment. Sociologically, sociological analysis can bring out the historical, psychological, and in some cases, the medical significance behind society's way of restoring trust. If someone loses confidence, he interprets his environment differently. Something is not just happening, someone is doing something to him. He has to find out what is happening and who is doing it and what to do about it. There is a mental disorder where one's own limbs are perceived to be foreign to the body. Or the sex reports that a patient suffering from this condition yelled one morning they sue the leg of a dead body up to me, cut it off, cut it off. The doctors didn't share his interpretation. They knew that something strange was happening, but they relied on the parameters they were used to and called the neuro neurological disorder. The patient, of course, didn't accept this either. The doctor's diagnosis was that a part of the patient's brain was impairing his cognitive capacities, leading to a partial breakdown of confidence in the world. The patient's diagnosis was that he had a right to be mistrustful of the hospital and the doctors. The doctors had to find a way to comfort the patient, knowing that uh, what he was experiencing, experiencing uh, would never, ever happen, and even if it did, it would never happen. <coughs> this way. A partial collapse of confidence is something you can cope with only if you are prepared to change your concept of trust. And you can do this only if you can answer the question, what should be done next? Someone who suffers the, suffers the partial collapse of confidence can psychologically survive only if he accepts a different concept of trust, one that others share. 
The patient may take tra tranquilizers and afterwards listen to the doctor's perspective. Maybe he'll adopt it, maybe he won't, but as long as he doesn't, there's no way out. This kind of confidence is a basic necessity. If you lose it, you can find something else to trust in, or you can lose your mind. You have to be trustful. And you have to be mistrustful too, but I'll come to that later. There's one reason why you have to trust. You cannot be mistrustful all the time, in every place, at every moment, moment without going crazy. <laughs> This claim is supported by Wittgenstein's writing on certainty. No one can doubt each and everything, and no one, no one can doubt purely and simply. <clears throat> As evidence, Wittgenstein pointed out the famous sentence which G. E. Moore tried to, with which G. E. Moore tried to prove that there is something you can really be certain of, namely, I'm sure that this is my hand. Wittgenstein said that a sentence like this makes no sense outside very particular circumstance, circumstances. The patient who saw his leg as a foreign appendage might, after a successful treatment, say, now I know this leg is really mine. Situations like that can occur, but they are not suited to serve as an epistemological or an ontological foundation. Philosophers sometimes think it makes sense to assume that there is something like doubt, pure and simple, which is why they undertake missions to identify that, that which admits no doubt under any circumstances. Which Wittgenstein thought otherwise, and I follow him. On certainty he writes, I'm sitting with a philosopher in the garden, he says again and again, I know that this is a tree, pointing to a tree, and a tree near us. Someone else arrives and hears it, and I tell him, this fellow is insane, we are only doing philosophy. Donald Davidson and Richard Rorty follow Wittgenstein and David Hume in their critique of radical skepticism. There is no such thing as radical skepticism, because there is no possibility that it exists. To be skeptical in one respect, you have to rely on quite a lot of things you and others are sure of. To doubt something in our common world, we have to make refer reference <laughs> to our common world. If anyone tries to deny this, you are best off leaving him be, as David Hume recommended. To be mistrustful in some respect, you have to live in a universe of trust. If you think it is not a good idea to be at a certain place at midnight, you go to a place that seems safe. When you do, you provide others with an example. Don't go here, you'd better go there. You show them a strategy to find a more trustworthy environment. You show them what to do and you show them that you are doing it too. Do you trust politicians? I don't. Yes, you do. Or let, it, let me put it this way. You are working on it. You vote because you want to change. Or you don't go to vote, and by doing so, you strengthen the so-called party of non-voters. You hear about a case of corruption. Maybe you go to the newspapers and become a whistleblower. Or maybe you don't and tell your friends it isn't worth it. If you want to change the government by voting, you have, we have, you have to rely on those who count the votes. If you don't vote, you don't vote for a reason. And you have to rely on the information you have about the manipulation of normal elections. And you have to assume that the people from whom you receive your information are trustworthy. Even if you say that, only, that the only solution is to topple the government, and the only way to, way to do this is to found a terrorist movement, you must undertake your preparations in a trustworthy environment. First, you have to collect evidence that the pol political system is not to be trusted. You have to inform yourself about how and where to get illegal passports, and that means you have to learn to trust the criminal network, and to know whom you can trust in. You need a secret apartment. You have to know where to get one, 
and pay for it in cash without appearing suspicious. You believe that the lights in this apartment work and that the electricity and water supply will work. You don't even think about it. <coughs> and that's essential that you don't even think about the things you trust in. You believe that, uh, yeah, you don't even think about it. If you want to hijack an airplane, you trust the schedules. You buy a ticket, you pay for it, and you trust that all this works. You take a taxi to the airport, and if you pay for it, you don't even think about the possibility that the taxi driver might say to you, $100,000, please. In short, to make our environment a little bit less trustworthy, you have to a lot of trust in it. You have to have a lot of trust in it. Someone invites me to give a lecture. I accept the invitation. I go to the place where I'm supposed to give the lecture. I know where it is. Let's say I've been there before and trust that, it, that they would have informed me had they changed the location. I was invited to give a lecture and I replied that I'd prepare one. I trust that, it will be, that I will be informed in time if those who invited me decided to change their plans. If they changed their plans without letting me know, my confidence in the world would not collapse, but I would be angry because I have the right to assume this wouldn't happen, and I would be uh, much more careful next time. But you see, this is not the case. For this to happen, you and I have to trust in many things. The infrastructure of this place, the technicians who repaired my personal computer when it broke, I was aware of the possibility and they backed up copies. And all you here who by listening, listening attentively or not to my talk, signalize that we have similar expectations with respect on an, to an academic event. Every minute of every day, we do many things to make our environment the trustworthy. Think of all the things you and others, people you know or you don't know and never will do, but are not aware of. For if we are aware of them, just thinking about it would not just keep us busy, it would drive us mad. So we don't think about it until we have to. But to have to does not mean finding yourself in a place, place where trust doesn't play a role in, any role in, a role in. You can't live in a world without trust. And that means you are active. Trust always means you do something and you don't think about it. And now think of all the things you and others do not do. And because you and others do not do them, our social environment stays the way it is. Everything you do or you don't do is an act of communication. You signal what others can expect and what they cannot expect. Others respond in turn. This communication is absolutely necessary. It's also absolutely necessary that neither you nor anyone else is aware of it. A trustworthy environment is maintained, maintained by permanent unconscious effort. Can trust be disappointed? Of course it can. People's, if people's trust is disappointed, they adjust their behavior accordingly. They modify it, obey it slightly, the composition of their environment and signal to others that they've done so. Others may change their way of behavior to accommodate the new environment or come to the conclusion that it doesn't concern them. Either way, such modifications have practical consequences and are acts of communication. It's social evolution. Together we construct a concept of normality regardless whether we like this idea or not. And this concept of normality is permanently changing and permanently being changed by us. Because we cannot live without trust, we work continuously to keep our environment a trustworthy place. To do this, we have to be mistrustful at times, or else we'll be permanently disappointed. We have to know what to do, or what to do instead, or how to find out what to do if we don't. In 1990, 
I met an elderly lady at a Spanish airport. She was walking around showing her ticket to everyone saying, Munich, Munich. She was from East Germany and she couldn't read or speak or understand English. She had not traveled, traveled by airplane before or not on her own and didn't know what to do. I explained to her in German, just sit down here, here's your gate, then you will be so you will see the sign boarding. I wrote it down for her. And then you go to that desk and they will help you board the right hand. She did not understand what a gate or a desk was. Not only that, she didn't seem to understand the words. She couldn't pick out a gate from among all the strange things around her. She was in the same situation we would be if a wildness guy died says to us, look at the tracks of the leopard on the surface of that rock. I assume most of us would say, sorry, I don't see them. What did the helpless lady do to, 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 to get help? She showed her ticket to everyone she met and read the words she could pronounce. Muni, 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 muni. I found a flight attendant and explained the situation. We both tried to change the lady's environment to make it more familiar. <coughs> We could only hope that our changes were for the better. But at least some trust was in it. She trusted that the, her environment was so and so, and there would be people who would understand this munich munich, and some outcome would be. And she proved to be right. To work together in this sense, directly or indirectly, whether in close contact with others or unaware of others' existence, makes us members of, the, of a society. It doesn't take much. All we need is a collective feeling of a we, that together we represent some, that something we can call us. In working together on and communicating about this collective project, a project that defines our normality, we provide a ceaseless flow of answers to mostly tacit <coughs> questions. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? I'm not talking about the big questions asked in historically momentous occasions, as when German demonstrators shouted the slogan, East German demonstrators shouted the slogan, We are the people, German, we are the people. This was, at a moment, a very meaningful slogan. Testifying to its importance was how it could be handled ironically. One demonstrator displayed the sign, Ich bin Volker, the equivalent of some, ich, Wir sind das Volk, ich bin Volker, the equivalent of something like, We are the people, I am Pip. Questions that concern trust, in contrast, are questions we do not ask out loud. We feel these questions do not need replies, though implicitly we are answering them all the time. But these questions lack all pathos and brook not a hint of irony. We do ask such, such questions in a melodramatic tremolo, when we do ask such questions in a melodramatic tremolo, questions like, who are we? It is because of standards for one kind of normality have dissolved and we need reorientation. It is because in all likelihood our trust has been shattered. Trust can be shattered on an individual and social on individual and social levels, and it has been shattered many times through history. None of us today share the beliefs of the uh, to come again to the Aztecs even though they thought their beliefs were absolutely necessary for life. Of those today who call themselves religious, very few, I think, think would say that calling oneself religious in the 21st century is identical to calling oneself religious in the Middle Ages. And those who do call themselves religious undermine the truth of their assertions by responding to questions. The question, no one living in the Middle Ages would have understood the question, are you a religious person? Not being religious would have been incomprehensible to them. Can trust 
collapse completely on an individual level, yes. For a moment, people can think they have fallen out of the world, of the state of normality as such. This is probably not the correct description of their state of mind. They have fallen, indeed, out of the world completely. They have fallen into a very different part of the world. They never wanted to inhabit. That's the truth. Normality has changed in a dramatic fashion and they need time and practice to cope, provided they can learn to cope. They overestimate the aspect of normality that is or seems to be out of joint. People have the ability to adapt to many places, even very ugly places, just because they live in them and the places are in the world. Many of those who survive will readapt to the melody and accept the new environment and its different standards of trust. If they can't, if they are unable to build any kind of environment of trust, they fall out of each and everything. Their perception of the outside world will collapse, their perception of their minds and bodies will collapse in one way or the other. They will die. Can trust collapse on a social level? Normally it does not. Social trust can undergo transformations, even dramatic ones. But as a rule, it doesn't collapse. That's why we can say that society represents a kind of continuity and that history and sociology study ongoing, study on ongoing developments. This doesn't mean that history and sociology aren't confronted with endings. And you have to describe what ends if you want to describe what persists elsewhere. During the Spanish conquest of the Caribbean, for some of the indigenous people, the shock literally drove them into extinction. They were not murdered, at least not directly. Rather, they simply stopped living. They stopped reproducing and, killing, and killed any infants who were born. Soon, adults began committing suicides. The Spaniards said that the Indian slaves were so lazy that they preferred suicide to work. The early Christians believed the world was going to end 500 years after Christ's crucifixion, and that the end of the world would be announced by the appearance of the Antichrist. What really happens, wars, starvation, epidemic diseases, seemed to confirm their fears. But this did not lead to a collapse of trust. People knew what to do. To go to church, pray, give big donations to monasteries, and even bigger sums upon their death. Archaeologists have observed that more churches were erected in the Byzantine Empire in the decades shortly before 500 uh, post-Christ crucifixion than before and after. The problem came when the year 500 passed and the end of the world did not come. Everything that had made sense before stopped making sense. The world had gone mad and people had no idea what to do. Some gave up their Christian beliefs and converted to ancient religions. Some burned down the churches and monastery and killed priests and monks. Others rejected the values of religion and civilizations and there were reports of, reports of orgies taking place in cemeteries. Others ran through the streets not knowing what to do. Others were said to have lost their capacity for human language and they barked like dogs instead. A strange uh, thing you read in the old chronicles, but um, a woman reported that during the bombing of Hamburg, she and her young daughter fled from the house. She crossed the street but told her daughter to stay. Soon after, the house lay in ruins and the woman found her daughter still standing there at the same place, unharmed, but barking. You can interpret the stories told, told about the final days of World War II in and around Berlin in a similar, not so dramatic way. Soldiers didn't know where the front was or who the enemy was, and they didn't know where to hide. 
Jan, Jan Wiebels swore allegiance to the Führer, but the German Wehrmacht had neither uniforms nor guns. Allied troops reported how disoriented German soldiers went to the prison camps to give themselves up. Not only was it better than getting shot, the barbed wire signaled a world in which life continued, not in the way they had hoped, but in the way they could accept as a new form of normality. A form of normality in which they could learn to trust and to mistrust. Still, it was a radical change. Some had almost reached the point where they no longer knew <coughs> what to do next. We all know the story of the airplane with a football team on board that crashed in the Andes. The survivors decided to eat the bodies of those who died in the crash. Before they did, each made an oath that should he die, he would permit the others to eat him. This ritual <coughs> enabled them to break the taboo and redefine the eating of their friends' bodies as a kind of mutual sacrifice. A photograph from the first years of the Soviet Union shows people leaning against a wooden wall before a kind of coffin, presenting heads and other human body parts. It appears they are presenting the body parts in public. And the camera that took the picture was merely recording the moment. Are the bodies for sale? Whatever the people are doing, and they are not doing it in secret. In their hunger and despair, they overcame the taboos of cannibalism and maybe the taboos of murder as well. What is more, they are showing that they or others overcame that taboo and that they or others are saving their lives by doing so. Through this gesture of public display, the people in the photograph are creating a new framework of normality, of life is, now. And this framework will affect everyone who comes in contact with it, even the youngest members of the community. They learn by looking at this. Maybe it signals a new economic order. This too could be called trust. Everyone understood that the extreme cold might kill them just as so surely as hungry people might kill them and eat them and think it normal. For people in this community, this is just how social life was now. At least the Entendu marketplace was selling body parts at prices people could. You see, trust in the way I use the term has nothing to do with whether something is good or cozy. Trust doesn't make life easy. It is something without which social life is impossible. And social life is possible under very ugly and excruciating circumstances, as we all should know. By information from the historians. Nevertheless, we have difficulties. We experience a certain disgust whenever the words trust and violence appear too close together. Some of us seem to believe that if trust binds people on a deep level, then violence must somehow be a foreign anti ethical substance. Those that feel this way forget that violence, and not only individual violence, has been part of every society ever known. Still, the role that violence plays, plays, plays in society can vary greatly. No society forbid, forbids or permits violent actions in general. Every society forbids permits or mandates violent actions in different ways. The problem is never violence as such, but violence committed in the wrong place, or at the wrong time, or against the wrong person, and ignoring a society's lines between permitted, forbid, forbidden and mandated violence 
can have severe consequences. It makes little difference how violent society seems to us or how strange or, or how strange those societies permitted uh, or forbidden or mandated forms of violence might be, might be. Every society uses violence and every society uses violence in different ways. And every society sees its own distinction, distinctions between, between forms of violence as normal of, or natural. And those of other societies as strange, ridiculous or barbaric. Often we see the distinctions made by other societies and other ages as a tantamount to making no distinctions whatsoever. This is not the case, but it shows how deeply our sense of what counts as a distinction is rooted in cultural self-understanding. There have been many moments in history in which different ideas of violence have run up against each other, causing confusion or even conflict. Once, one, side, one side says, so, they think they can permit all forms of violence against us? Well, to maintain our way of lives, we will permit all forms of violence against them. The process by which a society <coughs> distinguishes between different forms of violence has three aspects. Social, inter social interactions, the role of violence in government <coughs> institutions, and collective beliefs. Every society differentiates between different forms of violence and different sides of violence. Once the lines have been drawn, transgressions become a problem. The reason is that violence plays a very important part in how a society's sense of trust generates social cohesion. Violence requires a specific form of legitimation. Either you are forbidden to act violently, or you are required to act violently, or you are permitted to act violently, but need not. The cultural formation known as modernity, and by modernity I mean a transatlantic Western European and Central European culture born of the religious and political crises in the 16th and 17th centuries. This cultural formation we call modernity, the cultural formation in which we now live, demands something else of violence. Not only must we ask whether violence is carried out in the proper place, against the proper person, and by the proper, and by the proper person, we must also ask, is this violence truly necessary? Unlike all other cultural formations, past or present, Modernity has an idea of itself as, a progress, as progressing towards ever less violence. The violence modernity needs, uh, it justifies as needed for now, or as necessary to prevent other out, greater outbreaks of violence, or as necessary to pave the way to a future with less violence. In spite of war, in spite of the domestic and foreign policy in place, the use of violence has to be legitimated in this way. Whatever doesn't fit this framework of legitimation is not only forbidden, not only forbidden, it has to be accounted for. What went wrong? How could this happen? Historians, sociologists, <coughs> psychologists and psychiatrists have to perform explanatory work. By doing so, they build trust in modernity. Of course, something can occur in modernity that does not have a place in modern culture. But if and when that happens, someone must explain why it happened and why we can still trust in modernity. Doing so is hard work. But it keeps many academics busy. And for heaven's sakes, somehow it even works. There's no form of accepted violence in our daily lives. At least in Europe, no one of us wears a sword or a dagger or a gun, and if we do, there will be severe consequences. <coughs> Countries that carried out the death penalty for centuries have now abolished the practice, and most, most countries that have not abolished capital punishment do not execute people in public and use form of execution they believe to be less painful than those used in former times. Believe. 
is the operative word here. And they justify the practice by claiming that capital punishment is the best way to deter others from committing similar crimes. There are still wars in modernity, but the way they are legitimated has changed. The First World War was the first war referred to as the war to end all wars. Other wars were justified to prevent more severe violence. The, way, the war Nazi Germany waged in Eastern Europe was intentionally designed to break the rules of modernity and to demolish modern civilization. Afterward, people asked how could this happen? How could this outbreak of violence happen in a civilized country? With respect to the Soviet Union, they asked how could a country pave its way to modernity with millions of murdered and tortured people and create a state driven by suspicion, paranoia, and show to us. And referring to the United States, people asked how could a state that waged war against two barbaric regimes, Germany and Japan, use a weapon that killed tens of thousands in an, in in an instant and many more in the years that followed. A weapon that was not loved by the people who decided to uh, use it because it promised to be the weapon to end all wars, though now it seems to function a little bit this way indeed, but because it created a moment of delirium among, among the country's leading politicians who promised themselves greater and more effective wars. The question how could that happen? Can easily be answered. Just tell the story. Historians have and shall continue to do so. It's not a mystery, it's just history. It's putting down in detail what happened. Historians tell the story, there's no hidden agenda, there's nothing behind the scenes. You may ask why modernity's idea of itself did not collapse when modernity collapsed in part. By collapsed, I mean transformed itself in a way that abandoned the framework of normality and trust that characterizes modernity. That framework of normality and trust said that violence must be legitimated, that violence in society, both legitimate and illegitimate, must diminish over time that individual, collective, or state-supported eruptions of violence are criminal and pathological. Sometimes we have to account for something we must regard as a mystery. That was the framework of normality we called modernity. This framework created the illusion that what happened in the 20th century could not happen. But it happened. But a Benjamin wrote that the real catastrophe is that life goes on. History shows us that this was possible and will continue to be possible. Even in countries uh, that have experienced decades of civil war, there's still social trust. People know what to do. They vote for the right party. Or if they don't have the choice, they tow the party line of the local government. They fight, they try to survive, they get the awards they have been promised and the awards are withheld. They do their best together. Trust in Nazi Germany also meant knowing what to do, being part of the Volksgemeinschaft and behaving accordingly. Of course, not to be a Jew was not something you could choose. As, you, as long as you had the choice, you could emigrate, but you could never be sure whether you, whether you would be successful in that or not. And for a lot of Jews, the options for action were so limited that it was psychologically easier to deny the political reality. It was also a matter of one's powers of imagination. Could the transformation of civilization be that deep, that radical? Trust. And the Stalinist Soviet Union consisted in knowing that everyone, even members of the old Leninist guard at the Politburo, could be politically persecuted. Sometimes 
the regime's lies help make this true more bearable. At any rate, though, there was always a way to be on the safe side, or at least to believe you were on the safe side. And that was to denounce others faster than they could denounce you. Sometimes this was a very effective way of climbing the career ladder, both in politics and in business. Even a violent and evil environment offers options for action and provides answers to the question of what to do. And what did we, children of modernity, do after modernity collapsed in part? We acted as if it did. This was partly denial, partly mystification, and partly politics. And it was the explicit or inexplicit the conscious or unconscious will to reclaim and to perpetuate the previous standard of modernity and social trust. I cast my vote to do it consciously, without mystification, without illusion, do it as a realist, without being a cynic. What else is to be offered? You see, trust is a fuzzy concept, but it's not that fuzzy. This is a different uh, concept of trust that, than I was talking about. Um, my concept of trust is more sociological than, than yours, and is uh, more, it goes deep, it's more basic. Basic in a way that it has no um, normative implications. Uh, my concept of trust is uh, maybe you may say the most trivial one, is that life goes on, and life can go on even in a hell called family. Uh, people wake up in the morning, and they know what to do next. Maybe uh, to leave the bed immediately, and go to work, and not uh, to go through the uh, uh, breakfast time with their husband or their his wife. Um, to know what to do next is uh, even to act violently in this family business, in family framework. Uh, but if people suffer and they don't, if people suffer in these conditions, they do not, not know what to do next, but they do not 
want to do next what they did before. And then they come to you and say, what can we do to transform our concept of trust from this hell to a better, maybe just a little bit unhappy future? I'm, I'm kind of quite confused. Uh, I just would like to ask you whether you're actually saying contra Bauman that Nazism or the Holocaust was not, was in fact an aberration of modernity. Because what Bauman would argue yeah, okay. is that it was a consequence of modernity, modern civilization. And you're saying Nazi, the Nazi war aimed to demolish modernity and modern civilization. And in that, perhaps, they are also, in a way, anti Schmidt, who kind of divided the world very, very clearly. So I'm just, I'm just, can you just elucidate that? Yep, uh, because Bauman and Rowan is not very popular in Germany, but maybe... Bauman is very popular. Well, no, maybe not this, the modernity argument, no? The uh, publishing company, uh, which my, I uh, published my, my book, Trust and Love in Violence, published many books with Bauman in Germany. So, uh, and I know him quite well personally. But nevertheless, our concept of modernity is different. He uh, look, is looking at the aspect of modernity which is connected with the idea of a proper order, the idea of uh, speaking of a governing state and of uh, connected bureaucracy and so on. I'm speaking about this idea uh, which is indeed character characterizes modernity and no other cultural formation uh, I know of um, that uh, violence as such is a problem. In philosophy, this, uh, the first time this comes out in philosophy is with uh, Thomas Hobbes. Machiavelli has the old concept. Violence is something you know, the place where violence should be uh, used or where well, violence should not, should not be used, and it's not a problem as such. Hobbes is the first one to uh, look at it as a problem as such. If you look at the plays of Shakespeare, you will find uh, in the earlier plays, uh, Tito's Andalonicus, for example, where this is just the old way. This is, this has no, violence has no normative uh, implications. In Titus Antipolicus, people are yelling and crying because something has, is, has been done to them, and they say, not to me. They don't say, but this is violence. In other uh, later plays, this is treated very differently. And this concept, <coughs> of uh, violence is indeed intentionally should it be intentionally destroyed by Nazi Germany by the idea of the others are the barriers but we have to establish very different standards in war in society and uh, there was a sharp line between the past and the future Nazi Germany brand of. And this is uh, an aspect of modernity. Uh, Sigmund Baumann is uh, not so much looking at. And I would like to correct him in some way. This really follows on from the Nazi. Uh, the outrageousness of the Nazis, you see, started from it. But can we say with improved technology and improved social conditions, trust would grow and improve? Or do we need to be careful there? Um, I don't think uh, technology has, to, has much to do with it. Why do you think so? 
Well, it would be not when you think about it. Sorry? Possibly not. If technology improves things, as it should do. Well, I, I don't get the aspect of technology in this. Sense. If you look at the, you know, uh, modernity was inaugurated through violence, the French rule. Of course. So in a sense, uh, it was always integral to, to uh, violence was always integral to, to, to modern project. And the idea that human beings should be a people more of moral worth was often used <laughs> in, in almost the exact opposite way. Obviously, through colonialism, through, you know, of in, course, in of a course. sense, we, we can look at yeah, of course, the evidence, you know, how. With modernity, bounce escalates. You know, if you look at the statistics, how many people have been killed? You know, in, in, in 20th century when compared to previous 5,000 years, uh, and all these things. So, and so the <laughs> of, of the of the global population, much less, much less. No, but that, that is, but that doesn't, that doesn't that's not touch. The case. It's because, it's yeah, that is wrong. bigger. I think he's right. No, he's wrong. <laughs> I think he's <laughs> right, but, yeah. but nevertheless. That's not the answer of all these questions. Um, I don't deny, of course not, that modernity, as other uh, historical, historical uh, epochs, was based on violence. I don't deny violence in modernity. Because I don't deny it, I write this book, I'm not a lunatic. Uh, but look at the different ways of legitimizing violence. Even in the French Revolution, Robespierre was the first who demanded that the capital punishment <coughs> should be stopped. Then he said it is necessary, but it's necessary uh, just for the transformation to another step of society. And this was another concept of using violence in the Middle Ages. There was the idea that this form of violence is there and will be there in all future. You have this idea that this society is a transformation into a better future <coughs> where all this isn't needed anymore. It's a specific modern <coughs> attitude. Even in colonial crimes, yeah, they outside that, I'm sorry to say that violence is still needed because they are the barbarians. They have not our civilized attitudes. We have, some, we have a, a white man's burden. We have this mandate of, his, of history to execute this and we don't like it, but we have to do it. All these um, legitimations are specific modern. They don't uh, lead to nice ways of behavior. They sometimes lead to mass murders, massacres, even genocide. In this book, and I didn't speak about that in this lecture, in this book I try to describe how these legitimations lead to outbursts of violent actions, for example, in the 20th century. But still, these legitimations work somehow in Nazi Germany, they didn't work. So this just a break of this idea of legitimation. What? Oh, yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for a very stimulating lecture. I have one comment on Bauman and then a question for our speaker. Um, I think that, um, I'm saying this as a historian of violence in the um, 20th century, Europe and Germany in particular, um, that many historians have sort of moved beyond Bauman for a number of reasons. Of course, it's a very stimulating theory, uh, but I think um, most historians of Nazi Germany would argue that there are contradictory elements to Nazism, that it is both uh, uh, unthinkable without modernity, but also at the same time uh, contains reactionary elements in it, uh, you know, the whole sort of ideology. Um, 
Secondly, because it is a macro, um, sort of macro historical, macro sociological explanation without people in it. And I think what historians have in particular done in, in uh, recent years is to narrate human agency back into these macro historical explanations. Um, but that's the main reason. Of course, it is still a, a theory that many people, many historians uh, of, of the Second World War would engage with, um, though increasingly critically. But that's, of course, a sign of a good theory. Um, talking about grand theories, I was uh, you know, fascinated and convinced by many of your larger arguments. I was wondering whether there's, uh, like any grand theory, of course, grand theory is always open to uh, criticism in the detail. And I'm wondering whether there's uh, space in your master narrative for cultures of violence that center around um, a consciously created atmosphere of distrust. Uh, Nazi Germany would be one example where you have a force like the Gestapo, which is actually tiny, uh, but which operates on the principle of spreading distrust, that is promoting the idea that they are omnipresent and um, know everything uh, that is going on. So they uh, very consciously use um, the fact that they are weak in order to spread the propaganda that they, that they know everything, so that everyone would mistrust or distrust, not only uh, people at the workplace, but in fact their own family members. Um, more successful, and this is perhaps the most extreme uh, test of the, of the general theory, is perhaps the Soviet Union, um, particularly in the period of the, of the Great Purchase, um, which does not only create an atmosphere or a myth about um, omnipresence and about the state knowing everything, uh, it also has, uh, unlike in Nazi Germany, automatically lethal consequences. So in Germany, the idea of the Gestapo is we will find people, but if they are racially pure, mm -hmm. they can be bettered. Uh, in, in the Soviet Union, people don't have that option. Absolutely. Uh, so it is a culture of complete distrust. So how does that fit into the general? Uh, I tell a paragraph about that in the lecture I kept to it. In, in Nazi Germany, indeed, it was different. Uh, you could be more or less on the same side. If you were not a Jew, if you had been a communist or a social democrat before, if you don't listen to Radio London, and if you don't make uh, some remarks on the, uh, on the family table, that was that you were more or less on the same side. In the uh, Soviet Union, you were not. And this is, uh, how could life go on? Well, this is the answer. Life went on, and now look how. That means you can live with an atmosphere of mistrust. You can adopt to that atmosphere. You can live in it. <coughs> you f have to find strategies. That doesn't mean then those strategies worked, but in many cases they worked. And uh, just to say it very, very roughly, be the first one to denunciate. Uh, you could mm -hmm. build careers on that. And uh, there are a lot of examples uh, where <coughs> workers in a factory denounced their uh, the managing directors being Trotskyists, and they were shot. And one of this, uh, uh, one of the people got the job, and so on and so on and so on. So it worked. It is for us living in a different environment, nearly not understandable. But come to the facts and just describe how people managed to get a daily life in this atmosphere and they managed to do it. This is the answer. There is no uh, secret behind it. Look how they did it. And that was building up trust in this strange atmosphere. Trust means to know what to do next. And all the people uh, knew what to do next. Sometimes they did the wrong thing. <coughs> And then I.
uh, which is a question between victim and perpetrator. Now, as far as I understand it, in Stalinism and Stalinist regimes, uh, that line is can be blurry. Mm -hmm. uh, so former victims become perpetrators, um, and the kind of middle ground between the two, for the, for the overlapping, uh, can happen, and it does so. It did so less in in Nazi Germany. Um, now, bring up the sorry to bring this up again, but uh, bring up the case of Sigmund Bauman himself. Uh, as we all know, um, uh, in a very uh, complicated uh, history, and it's not that straightforward. So, in, in one person here, we may have uh, some of those things coming together as well. In a time, in a, in a kind of uh, uh, in a strange timeline. I wonder whether you have any, any comments on, on uh, being on both sides. Well, being or on what? Well, having taken part in cleansing operation in Poland after 1944, um, having been, you know, quite working for the secret services, um, and so on, <coughs> it's all not public knowledge. Um, but it's just an example. I mean, it's just, I don't want to be too too much focused on Bauman. I mean, he might just be a, uh, an example of, you know, how Stalinism works, as opposed to, would you find the same or similar thing in Nazi Germany? Well, um, no, it's just a, indeed in, in this very different society. And, uh, you don't find that the murderers uh, find themselves uh, just one or two years later on and they're uh, being shot by others. Uh, but such examples exist. If you go to the. Uh, in Auschwitz, there was uh, some SS uh, officer who was shot at the same place. Polish uh, uh, resistors were shot, but he was an exemption. He was a very extreme uh, and uh, what is um, unterschlagen? He did very extreme. Um, holding back the he, he stole. He stole money which belonged to to the government in an extreme. Uh, away and so many. He was unbearable anymore. And they even shot him at this very symbolic place. But this is an absolute exception. And you don't have something comparable to the Stalinist show, show trials in, 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 uh, in, in Nazi Germany. But uh, to speak more generally, if someone has been a victim of violence, of political violence, of whatsoever, why shouldn't be a, a, a perpetrator? Why should? Because it's suffering. It's suffering, a way of learning. Sometimes it is. But you can't count on that. We had the experience that when uh, the, the Institute, I, I found it, made an exhibition which caused a lot of I should I say, it was very much debated in, in Germany about the crimes of the German Wehrmacht. And we thought that was an exhibition we would show for one year or one and a half, and we showed it nearly 10 years. Um, there were a lot of people, uh, people of, of my generation, younger people, who said, well, what you are telling us can't be because our fathers or our grandfathers suffered so much. For example, in Stalingrad. They thought it would be an argument. They were victims. You are a victim, period. Well, you are a victim and you are <coughs> much more things in life than maybe an ugly murderer. There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. Well, thanks very much for a very lively talk, and uh, I just...